uh, we, we would present uh, and motivate um, a model that was proposed a few years ago by Antonio and Eva. Um, I will start by showing you where I got my data that got me interested in this kind of modeling. Um, so for me, the, the, the question arises from actual uh, data analysis and actual experiments. Um, once you are, you will, you will have some idea of where the data come from, what they look like. Um, I will briefly discuss some experimental facts that you, you find generally uh, in uh, neural systems that uh, made me very happy with a stochastic model. Um, and so that, that, that's in a way laying ground for the, the actual model that, that Eva and uh, Antonio developed. Um, and then Eva will, will take over with uh, the kind of questions we, we can address with the model they developed and uh, enter into the details. So the data. Uh, most of the time, people talking about uh, exercise recordings in, uh, in neuroscience will show you uh, pictures of a monkey or a rat or uh, something uh, that looks like a vertebrate. Uh, I started doing exercise recordings uh, on something much simpler, an insect that you see on the left here, uh, Shisosaka americana. So uh, that's, that's a cousin of uh, Shisosaka gregaria that you find in Africa, the one that is now eating lots of crops uh, in Eastern Africa. And um, we take this uh, insect, prepare it. When I see prepare, when I say prepare, I mean that I cut the legs, I open the, um, the head uh, and uh, remove the gut because in insects, the, the brain because insects do have a brain, sits on top of a gut. So if you don't remove a gut, you have a brain that moves up and down, and that's bad for your recordings. So we remove the gut. The gut. And I should say, when I was a kid, I never played uh, cutting legs of spiders. Okay, It came pretty late for me, this kind of uh, perversion. So once the, the locust is prepared, you see it from the top here. It's hard to perhaps to, to guess what it is. The head is around here. That's the, do you see my uh, my pointer on the screen? We don't okay. see the answer. So <laughs> in the middle of a... Uh, yes, yeah, we will see it. We see it. Yeah, we see it. <laughs> so in the middle, you have its... Uh, that's the head around the, the yellowish part here. And around the head, we built a, a small swallow nest uh, with bee wax, which that allows us to keep the brain in a physiological sol uh, solution. You see the antennae on both sides, and for the for the insect, the nose is the antennae. Okay, the olfactory receptors are on the on the antennae. Uh, that's the thorax, and that, that's the abdomen. What you see here on the left is the probe. So that's what holds the accessory electrodes. And what you see coming from the, the bottom is a small plexiglass tube that brings the odor on the antennae, and that's a view from the side. That's the swallow nest around the head. That's the tube bringing the odor. And you guess here the, the probe that you will see much better here. So that's, that's a view from the top of the preparation. Again, the head, the antennae living on both sides. The wire you see here is where you had the gut before I removed it. And the yellowish part in the middle is the brain. So insects do have a brain again. If we make a close-up on this part of the brain, you see this structure and this small sphere-like region here is called the antennal lobe. That's the first olfactory relay of the insect. That's the equivalent of the olfactory bulb for us. Uh, the dimensions are roughly 400 micrometers in diameter and what you see sitting on the left side here are my is my, my recording probe it's made of two shanks um, made of, of uh, silicone and on the shanks you have some bright spots here that are iridium deposits these are the actual electrodes so to give you an idea of the dimensions the, the width of a shank is 80 microns 
the thickness of each shank is between five and ten microns, so they, they are li little swords. Okay, okay, and you see that they have a specific. The, the recording sites have a specific pattern. They are grouped by groups of four recording sites that we call tetrodes. The diagonal of one tetrode here is fifty microns. If I push gently the probe so that the two lowest groups of four, so the two lowest tetrodes, are roughly 100 microns below the surface of the, the tissue, so inside the brain. For one second on a group of four recording sites, so one tetrode, I will get data that look like that. So never forget, this probe is not tiny compared to this piece of tissue. That means when I push the probe, even if I do it gently inside the tissue, I kill cells. So the method is not uh, non-invasive, okay? I destroy things and I don't know exactly what I destroy when I do these recordings. And it's not because I'm working on an insect that it's like that. People doing recordings on vertebrates have exactly the same problem, okay? So this method has its own artifacts and you should always keep that in mind. So, but now let's forget about the, the artifacts. We have these data that are filtered between 300 hertz and 15 kilohertz. And what is interesting for me here are these peaks, these sharps, devi sharp deviations here. And these are the action potentials viewed from outside of the cell, meaning that if I have several cells in the neighborhood of my electrodes, I will record all of them at the same time. So the first task I will have to address when I work with these recordings is I will have to separate the activities of the different neurons that are viewed from this um, data. And that's called spike sorting. It's a fascinating subject. People uh, like me like to spend their life working on the subject, but I won't bother you with that today. When we end up this first stage of the data analysis, so when we have done the spike sorting, and again, that's not neutral, okay? Different people do it in different ways and they will have more or less different results, but I'm convinced that the way I do it is the correct one. And after the sorting, I end up with data that look like that, so like barcodes. So each tick represents the time of a spike of a given neuron. Here you have three neurons recorded simultaneously. For this setting, most, most of the time, I have between five and 10 neurons, knowing that in this region of the brain of the insect, there's 800 neurons. So 10 neurons is not that tiny compared to the total number of neurons. So these are spike trains, and these will be the objects I will, we will concentrate on in this talk. So why, why should we bother with, with spike trains? First thing to know is that for a long time now, since uh, seminar work by Adrian and Zotterman in, in 1926, uh, we have good reasons to postulate that the spikes are the information carrier across large distances in the brain. It's not the waveform that counts, it's not the amplitude, it's just the spike time. So as soon as you, you, you adopt this, this working hypothesis, then it makes sense to, to study spike trains per se, because that's what successive regions of the brain get as information to, to, to do something useful with. And if you're um, in, inclined to do some modeling or some, some mathematical formalism, then you can consider modeling these, these spike trains uh, without necessarily considering the biophysical spike generation mechanisms. Okay, that doesn't mean that it doesn't count, just means that if you have a handy model that generates uh, point processes, uh, spike times, it's worth considering if it's easy to work with. Uh, one remark that is uh, often uh, overlooked is that everything is not mediated by spikes in the brain. Okay, in the retina, so right now that when you're looking at this talk, at these slides, uh, your retina is working full speed and most of the cells in your retina are not spiking. The only cells in the retina that do systematically spike are the ganglion cells that are the output cells of the retina. But all the cells in between the receptors and the ganglion cells almost never do, uh, fire a spike. 
And it's like that because you need a spike when you want to propagate in a reliable way a signal over a long distance. And long distance for cells means more than 100 to 200 micrometers. So don't forget that most neurons are very large cells compared to the typical cells of your body. Okay, I'm moving my hand here. So there's a neuron somewhere in my cortex here that goes down in my spinal cord. Its axon is tens of centimeters long, half a meter long. Okay, that's very long for a cell. And if you want to transmit a signal reliably over such a long distance, you need spikes. On the other hand, the retina is very thin, the, the cells are very short, so you don't need spikes. So that said, we are working with spiking cells. And one thing that perhaps you, you remarked while looking at this figure is that these spike times don't look very uh, orderly. It, it's kind of messy. So that suggests that it would, it would make sense to, to work with a stochastic model for this kind of data. And uh, before we present the model uh, in details, I will argue that there's good reasons to, to, to work with a stochastic model, given what we now know about the way neurons are working. So the first thing is these spikes are mediated by opening and closing of ion channels. The opening and closing of the ion channels is controlled by the uh, uh, voltage difference across the membrane, so membrane voltage. These ion channels are proteins that are sitting across the lipid bilayers. Uh, these are tiny objects, uh, 8 to 10 nanometers big, large. And as any molecular size object, they, they switch back and forth between different conformations. What the voltage does when it changes across the membrane is that it favors the opening of a channel or it favors the closing of a channel. When you recall with a sophisticated technique called patch clamp, um, you stick a, a glass capillary to the surface of a cell. In principle, it should not work, but in practice, it works very well. This, this, the fact that we can stick the, the, the capillary to the surface of a cell. And once that is, this configuration is obtained, we can observe opening and closing of single channels. So what this figure here shows you are nine successive responses among 300 when a voltage step 40 millivolts large is applied to a pipette. These downward deflections here are opening of a single sodium channel. If you repeat that 300 times and you sum the 300 responses, you get something looking like this. Okay, that looks like what Hodgkin actually recorded from the squid giant axon. The point is that with this sophisticated technique, we get access to the individual channels. And Hodgkin and Huxley, when they worked, didn't have a clue about the molecular nature of the, the conductance they were uh, measuring. Okay, they never speak about channels because at the, uh, at the time when we were working, we didn't know that there were channels in membranes. But now we know. And so the, the first striking feature is that the, the, the opening and closing and the, are random to the best of our knowledge. And we, we describe that with, with uh, Markov processes, in fact. So you have a first source of viability in neurons and in every neuron because when you want to have a macroscopic current, like here, you, you need to generate this current to have many tiny stochastic channels active. And that will generate fluctuations in your current. And that has consequences on the, the output of a neuron. And that's the first paper I could find um, from the 60s, late 60s, uh, by two guys, uh, Verven and Dirksen, I, I'm not sure I'm pronouncing their names correctly, um, recording from a motor neuron of a frog in a very 
sophisticated preparation because they manage to isolate one node of Fourier, so that these are the relays that are boosting regularly the spike when it goes down from the motor neuron to the muscle. And they, they kept the node of Fourier at very near the threshold to get a spike. And when they were just at this threshold, they could see that the, the, the time of the spike was fluctuating, as illustrated here. And if they moved the memory potential a bit up or a bit down, they could modulate the time at which these spikes were appearing. But they still had, they always had this, this jittering effect. And if you check the paper and they relate precisely this jittering of the spike time to the memory noise they can record. And again, when we did this work, we didn't know that channels were there. Okay, so they were just looking at the, uh, the noise on the recording. But the point is that we, we have a first location or a source of viability due to this random closing and uh, opening of channels will have jittering on the, the time of the spikes. The second uh, source, and for me, the major source that you will, we will find in, in the CNS of fluctuation is illustrated mainly on the, the right side of this figure. What you see at the upper right here, the, the B part, is are successive responses to the same stimulation of a single synapse. And you see that sometimes there's nothing, sometimes there's something not that large, sometimes it's larger, and every time you have this noisy trajectory. So the noisy trajectory is due to opening and closing of channels. They are not voltage gated, but they are gated by the, uh, by the neurotransmitter, in that case GABA. And the large fluctuations, and you have a statistical summary of, of them here, are due to fusion of one, two, or more vesicles. If you remember the, the talk of Suzanne uh, two weeks ago, that's precisely what she was talking about when we, we, she made this drawing with a vesicle uh, at different positions with respect to the calcium channel. So that will give you, as you see, large fluctuations. And so these are the main sources of ability that you will find in every central neuron. And once you, you realize that, it makes full sense to have models with strong stochastic components. The question then becomes, where do you introduce stochasticity in your model? Um, uh, the kind of uh, direct way would be, okay, we take the, the usual detailed biophysical model, so detailed morphology of a cell, we virtually like voltage-gated conductances uh, along the membrane, and we use um, a Markov process instead of uh, the Oshinesle model. Uh, some people do that. So the main problem we have with that is it takes a lot of time to compute. And you have a huge number of parameters. The opposite extreme, and these are modeling choices, okay? I'm not saying that one is better necessarily than the other. It depends on what you want to study. The other extreme, as that, that's the, the one we, we took, is to, to lump all the sources of ability at a single locus in the model. And that's what uh, Eva will shortly explain. One last point I want to, to discuss before we, we, we go into the model detail is the fact that in the model we use, every time the neuron spikes, there's a reset. So it, for, it forgets what happened before. And that's, for a physiologist, that's kind of natural if you consider a, a tiny cell, because it, the, the, axon, the, the, action, uh, the axon ex, uh, apart, it, it behaves as a isopotential compartment, but the large neurons most of us are interested in, the pyramidal cells that you see here and here, are very large cells. And it's not obvious that if you have a spike just in the soma, then you will force the memory potential to go to zero everywhere uh, at the same time. But we know, we, we observed directly in the last 20, 25 years, that in fact, these apical dendrites, so the large dendrites that emerge from the cell body, can sustain action potentials. That's shown here. So this recording shows you a pyramidal cell from a, a rat, a cortical slice. 
you have a patch pipette that is attached to the soma with a blue dye inside. So you see the blue dye diffusing into the cell. And then you have another patch pipette that is stuck to the dendritic tree with a, a green dye. Okay, so you see the green dye diffusing into the cell. So you're recording the same cell at two different locations. And you see that when you have a spike here in the soma, you have a spike climbing back in the dendritic tree. And this spike, to a first approximation, will force a reset of, of the whole dendritic tree. A more sophisticated way to, to look at the same thing, again, a pyramidal cell, but this time that's using a, a voltage sensitive dye. So you have some molecules that in, go into the cell membrane and their distribution within the cell membrane depends on the membrane potential. And they move very fast when the, when the membrane potential changes. And depending on their concentration, their fluorescence change, changes. So you, you can follow the membrane potential by following the, the fluorescence of this dye. And you have, of course, now good spatial resolution. So you see here the fluorescence signal at different locations along the dendritic tree. And you see that when you have a spike in the soma, you also have a spike up in the dendritic tree. So the, in the field, the, the usual way to, to interpret these dendritic spikes is to link them to plasticity. But so I, I, I don't have any, any uh, clear idea about uh, their involvement about plasticity, but the, the first and basic consequence is that since you have a spike coming back in the dendritic tree, you will reset the dendritic tree as well as you will reset the soma. Good, so I will, I will speak about um, the mathematical model that we uh, propose to, to answer uh, several questions th that arise um, after the introduction of Christophe. Um, the main points that I wanted to highlight about that model is um, it's simple to implement. Christophe has already spoken about that. All sources of stochastic variability are gathered together in a single common source of noise, which will actually be the, the random time appearance of the, of the spiking. So this will be for the specialists for mathematics and um, models with uh, stochastic intensity. Uh, the model is not complicated. I will try to convince you about that, such that we are actually able to produce exact mathematical proofs. And it's still rich enough such that it enables us to give uh, answers to, to some, at least some important questions in this model. So I try by uh, evoking some of these questions that arose, um, for example, after the introduction of Christoph, and then I will just spend the rest of the time to explain you the model. So there will be no proofs, just an explication of the model and what it tells us. Okay, ah, good. So, this one, good. Uh, first kind of questions is, suppose you have a system of, of neurons, which is basically in equilibrium, so in, in some stable state, and then it's exposed to some initial stimulus. Uh, is it possible in our model to, uh, to explain how the system relaxes back to equilibrium after this initial expo exposition? And, and how long does this take? Is it possible to to relate this relax relaxation time to, to the parameters that we will introduce in our model. Um, second kind of questions that I will speak about is, uh, does the brain operate in a metastable regime? We have seen a talk by uh, Morgan, Andrea, and Leo Planche about this. Um, metastable means that uh, apparently the system is behaving in a stable way, and then all in a sudden it leaves this uh, this regime and goes to another one, which means that it was only temporarily stable, so which is called uh, metastability. I will learn to. Uh, second kind of questions is, I will present your model, which is a model, a microscopic model. Okay, so it tells you the behavior of a lot of interacting neurons, a huge system. Is it possible to go to macroscopic limits and to explain macroscopic behavior like EEG, fMRI from the description that is relatively detailed at the microscopic level? One of the possible questions in this um, 
context is, is it possible to explain the appearance of oscillations or of synchronous behavior of several neurons? What we did in the recent work together with uh, Christophe and uh, Antonio is to, to speak also about short-term memory and to show how we can explain that within our model. Okay, and then there are of course statistical questions that, uh, that are very interesting to address. Uh, the most important one is certainly how is it possible to identify the functional interaction graph from spike trains of some neurons, which means that we are basically typically in situations where we only observe a tiny part of the total system and the overwhelming part of the system is actually hidden away. Um, and the more general question is how is information encoded in spike patterns uh, and raster plots like the ones that uh, Christoph has showed you. So these are only some questions that we would like to, uh, to, to ask. We have been able to answer to some of them partially. Some of them is ongoing work within the model class that I'm going to, uh, to speak about now. And the model class is what we call systems of interacting point processes uh, with memory, memory of variable length. And this, uh, we have first introduced that in a paper together with Antonio some time ago. It was in 2013 and it appeared in the Journal of Statistical Physics. And so the rest of the talk is devoted only, I, I will try to explain you the model and what it tells us, okay? So this comes now. Um, so it's point process models and we are able to deal with um, with a huge system of neurons, can even be infinite, that's nice for mathematicians, it's also nice for for people from neurobiology because the brain is indeed huge. It's not only 10 neurons, but it's a, a tremendous number of them. So we have a huge system. I give them a name. They are called little i. So in, in a certain index set, don't, don't worry about that. It's, so it's a set of neurons. For me, neurons are points, okay? So I don't take into account any spatial structure, no axonal transport, anything. It's a point and I will only describe the spiking times of all the neurons in these huge systems. Okay. Um, the spiking appears as a random function of what we call the membrane potential. And the membrane potential, which will, which will be a stochastic process, just accumulates the stimuli coming from the presynaptic neurons over time. And then spiking occurs in a random way, we say, uh, with a stochastic intensity depending on the height of the potential at the given time. I will make all this precise in a minute. But before making it precise, just two comments. Uh, Christoph has already been speaking about the, the reset. So when the neuron spikes, it goes itself back to a reset potential and for simplicity in our model we take it equal to zero but it could be anything and at the same time it gives some additional amount of potential to its postsynaptic neurons and this influence might be delayed so it's possible to to describe this in the in the model which is the effect of chemical synapses the reset of the spiking neurons potential to the reset potential induces a discontinuity from a mathematical point of view. Amazingly, that's sometimes much more difficult than working without reset. Okay, we will see that later. So let's go. I will show you some formulas. I try to explain them in all details. Oh, still not many formulas. So as I told you, so it's point processes that we consider. So each neuron is described by the time series of successive um, spiking times. But instead of just uh, writing these, um, how do you call it, barcodes, I mean the, these raster plots, we will sum up the number of spikes that we have observed within a, a given period. That's for mathematical reasons, it's more convenient to, to deal with. So this is what people call counting processes. So I associate a counting process to each of the neurons in the system. So n i of t, i is the index for the neuron that I'm interested in. n is like number of t is just the number of spikes of the neuron during 
interval zero t. I started some time and then I, I count all the neurons. So this is an increasing process. It increases by one at each spiking time of the neuron and it's very convenient to, to work with this. Okay. So people say, so now I, I come to the stochastic modeling. We suppose that this counting process has an intensity process which is stochastic and this is called lambda i of t. It's the spiking probability, the infinitesimal spiking probability of neuron i at time t. And it just tells you that given a time t, and given that I have observed all the history and all the other neurons up to this time, the probability that neuron i will, will spike in a very small time interval t, t plus dt, is given by the intensity times the length of the interval. Okay. So we also say that lambda i of t is the in instantaneous jump rate of the neuron at that time. So this is stochastic, but it's known at time t. And this ft here is for mathematicians, is what we call the filtrations. It's just everything that I have observed up to time t. So it's, uh, it's the history up to time t. OK. So this formula, so the infinitesimal probability of jumping during a small time interval, given the history, suggests a time discrete simulation scheme that I will tell you now. It's not what we actually do, but it helps us understanding what, what is actually happening. So we can bin the time into small time intervals of length delta. It's a time step that we take fixed, it's small. And then within each of these uh, time intervals, we can just accept to have a spike or not according to some uh, Bernoulli random. We, we flip a coin with the probability intensity just at the time step before, times delta, we accept the spike and we reject the spike with, the, uh, with one minus this probability, okay? So this would be Bernoulli experiments over time, small time steps. If I let delta tend to zero, actually one can show that time length up to the next spiking time is an exponentially distributed random variable. It's not exactly exponentially distributed because it depends on the parameter that is moving over time and which is random. And this is what is uh, uh, exactly expressed by uh, stochastic intensity, okay? So if you understand this discrete scheme, which would be a sort of Euler scheme for simulating the process, you have understood what intensity needs. So it gives you infinitesimal probabilities of spiking or not. So, okay, so everything we have to know is in these spiking probabilities, in these intensities. Uh, if we have an intensity which is fixed, deterministic and a constant, then actually this gives rise to a Poisson process. In Poisson processes, successive inter-spike intervals would be independent, which is of course not the, the case in real neurons. So, intensities which are deterministic are not suitable for modeling uh, interacting neurons because there are dependencies between neurons and there are also dependencies on the um, memory structure on the history of the given neuron. And this is actually what is expressed in the intensity and that's what I'm going to show you in the next slide. So I give you the formula for the intensity which tells exactly how at a given time t neuron i in its spiking probability depends on its own past, okay? So it's a deterministic function, which I call fi, this is the jump rate function of some expression, which is the sum of the past influences of the presynaptic neurons on the neuron itself. So maybe, so for the mathematician, I wrote this first uh, formula, Z should be N, I apologize. So this is the spiking train of the jth neuron uh, if it is influencing neuron I. And uh, for the neurophysiologists, I wrote it this way. It's the same thing. So it's a sum over all neurons that directly influence I. And it's a sum over all, pre uh, over all spiking times before time T. Uh, and then these sums are weighted by some uh, spiking weight influence function that I'm going to speak about in, in two minutes, okay? Um, you see here, maybe you see this Li of t, which is the last spiking time of the neuron that I'm interested in. So I start summing up the influences 
coming from the presynaptic um, neurons at the last spiking times, which is due to this reset to to the reset potential at each spiking time. Okay, so this is actually this discontinuity that I have been speaking about, or the reset. Okay, so let's see more about this H function. So H J to I measures how neon J influences I. So there is a notion of synaptic weights behind. And it also depends on the time elapsed since the last spiking time of J. So I sum over all spiking times of J since the last spike of I. And this influence might vanish as time goes by. And this is expressed by the, by the function H. In our model, we can take any function H. It's needs some integrability conditions. I'm not going into the details, but it's not always of compact support. So it might depend on the whole history up to up to the beginning of the of the of the history of, of time. Exactly. So which means that from a mathematical point of view, the process is not of finite memory. So it's not a Markov process. Okay. So we have prepared with Christoph some nice slides which tells you how this aggregation over the past is actually working. So this double sum, so sum over the neurons that influence I and sum over the past spiking times is called a convolution over the past and over the interactions. And I show you by these pictures how that works in the case of a single neuron. So I will not have this sum here, only the sum of the last spiking times uh, with the piecewise constant function H. So time is going by here up to time zero, h is zero, which is normal because it has to be a causal function. It depends only on, on positive uh, time slots because these times are always positive. We look back into the past. It is of compact support, which means that it doesn't, it, it feels the memory only during a time interval of length one, and then it goes back to, to, to zero, okay? So we have, memory of the inference during a time interval of length one, and then we go back to zero. And I show you how that works in this convolution structure for two different underlying spike trains. So these red things here are the evolution of the counting process that counts the successive spikes, say of one given presynaptic neuron. Okay, so the first jump appears here, second jump appears here, third one is here. And you see that the inter-spike intervals are rather far away. Okay, so we have to wait a long time up to the next spike. So in the beginning, in blue, you have what I would call the membrane potential, which is the aggregation of the influence of the past. So at the first spike, I immediately react, I feel the influence and I go up. But I forget about the influence one time step, step later and go back to zero because I have already forgotten, okay? Then comes the next spike. Once again, I go up by one step. Takes a long time up to the next spike, so I forget about that. Okay, so you have this picture for the membrane potential. This picture is completely changed when the interspike intervals are shorter. So here, first jump appears, I go up. Next jump appears immediately. Well, at least rather, rather quickly. So I go up again, okay? Then I forget here, I go down because I forget about the first influence. The second is still there, but then comes the next jump, so I go up again, okay? So you see that two different input spike trends lead to completely different pictures of the membrane potential. And what we also see in this picture is that the potential is a deterministic function of the presynaptic spike trends. So the only stochasticity is in the realization of the counting process of the spike trends. Okay. So we call this process, which is the sum over the presynaptic neurons and the sum over the, the past spiking times, we call that the membrane potential of the neuron I at time T. It, so as I said, it's a deterministic function of all past spiking times. It is not a Markov process, at least not for general H functions here. And at each spiking time of new and i, this process goes back to zero because of this reset to resting post potential that we chose equal to zero. Okay. So to summarize, our model is an integrate and fire model because the new and at a given time fires at a rate which is a 
deterministic function of the potential. So it depends on the height of the potential. And this function, well, you can imagine something like of, log of logistic shape like this, which expresses actually the fact that the same stimulus might have more or less influence depending on whether the potential is already close or not to the saturation threshold. Saturation threshold would be somewhere here. Okay. Good. Here comes an example. I said it's, uh, these age functions are related to synaptic rates. So quite often we model them in the following way. We have a fixed synaptic rate of neon J on I, which is either positive if it's excitatory or negative. And then we forget about past influences at exponential speed. The bounded memory case is exactly what we saw in the, in the two figures that I tried to explain you some minutes ago. Okay. So it's, a, it's an integrate and fire model. Integrate because we have this summing up fire because, well, evidently there are, there are, there are action potentials. The threshold is random. Why it's random? Well, because of this, um, as I explained to you, because of this stochastic intensity, uh, which means that at each step I decide or not to spike with a given probability. So it's not a fixed threshold, it's a random threshold. Of course, other approaches to model the membrane potential have been proposed in the literature. Uh, quite often, actually, you, people use fixed thresholds, but random membrane potential processes like diffusions. We could choose to use Hodgkin-Huxley process with noise or the model of gerstein mandelbrot which is just a Brownian motion with a drift. And then you say, okay, spiking appears when, when hitting, hitting a certain threshold. Um, these models are beautiful models. But you need to study the laws of the hitting times because spiking appears when hitting this fixed threshold, which is actually difficult from a mathematical point of view. There are no closed formula and it's difficult to, to put them into a network. So the model we propose is, it is easy to speak of network behavior to pass to mean field limits and simulating of our model is easy. And so we won't have time to tell you about that, but Christopher gave a series of lectures about that in Lascon. Okay, so I will just close by giving you an overview of some mathematical results that we have been able to, to produce in this model class. We started when this, this first paper by Antonio and myself in 2013 was in discrete time actually, so it was a kind of cellular automaton where we studied uh, the existence and the uniqueness of a stationary version of a process. Stationary means that all over all in the mean behavior the process will always be behave the same and we did that by using a certain um, perfect simulation technique we also did that in continuous time uh, with a, a phd student pierre odara uh, by using the same kind of perfect simulation then we have made first attempts to the statistical estimation of the interaction graph. Um, in the case without reset, which would be what people call Hawks processes, there has, there has been a lot of work by uh, Patricia on this topic, of course. Um, and I think here is still a lot of things to do huh? because the main problem comes from the fact that uh, we only observe a tiny part of the system and the huge overwhelming part of the spiking activity is hidden and we don't observe it. The study of mean field models, this is an answer to the questions, how can we describe macroscopic behavior from, uh, from this microscopic model? Because in our model, we, we describe the spiking activity of each single neuron. So uh, these are, well, there's an overwhelming literature over that. I tried to mention everybody, but certainly did not. So this is related to uh, what people call, call mean field models and propagation of cases where one is able to describe the typical behavior of a given neuron with, with, within a large class of similarly behaving neurons as the number of neurons tends to infinity. So this is very active uh, research and still ongoing, of course, and one tries to de deduce um, information on a single neuron from the mean field limits, which are sometimes easier to, to analyze, not always of course. The discontinuity which comes from, from the reset to zero actually um, 
and the difficulty in this. Okay, one last word. We are able to incorporate plasticity to the synapses. I said that these WIJs, um, they are not necessarily uh, fixed, so they can be random. We made a nice work, but uh, without reset, together with Antonio and Christophe on that, on short-term facilitation. And then there is ongoing effort to explain metastability, which means that over a long time, the system seems to be stable and then suddenly uh, leaves this, uh, this stable behavior and goes to another state. So this is related to metastability. There have been several papers by uh, PhD students and postdocs of uh, Antonio, so Morgan, André, and uh, together with Leo. Uh, first work by Ludmila and Miguel. And uh, myself, I just finished a paper on that with uh, with a guy from Paris 6, Pierre Montmarchi. Okay, and I guess, uh, so that's all we wanted to tell you, I guess, yes. Thank you for your attention. Christophe, uh, Eva mentioned two uh, models, the one where uh, you have this potential, which is a part of the stochastic intensity, and then you you have a kind of random threshold, and you have the classical integrate and fire, where you, you spike when you reach a threshold. Yeah. From a biological point of view, which one seems the most credible? Biologically, you would you would go for the, the diffusion model with a fixed threshold. Naively, that's what 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 I would do. Um, and when you when you look at at actual uh, voltage traces, uh, I it's not not too too far from from a diffusion, a uh, diffusion with jumps with jumps, but. Um, the, and you, you you have a big technical difficulty when you start working with these uh, diffusion-like models because you have to get the, the first passage uh, time, and that that's a pain. Um, I mean, uh, unless you work with uh, Brownian uh, motion with drift, you don't have any any nice solution uh, to to work with. So anyway, we we are simplifying a lot. Uh, what what real neurons are, are doing and um, as soon as you decide that you put uh, and you, you you lump all sources of ability at a single locus um, and why not uh, trying to put it where it's easier to work with I, I, that's the way i would justify uh, the, um, uh, the the approach that that uh, Antonio and Eva used, and of uh, the one you use with, with the Hox process, um, it's much easier to work directly with, with intensity than it is to work with a kind of brilliant motion reaching a fixed threshold. Okay, thank you. But and you, that's debatable. I mean, that's that's uh, and that's true that it's a problem when you talk to physiologists because for them it's much more intuitive to look at the process as diffusion reaching a fixed threshold. OK. So some authors say that uh, 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 the main source of variability for neural spiking uh, is not the, the ion channel noise or synaptic noise, but the noise due to the bombardment, especially when you model large scale networks. That's for large scale networks. We, when you have a large scale network, the main source of variability comes from the stochastic bombardment, the random uh, noise generated by the bombardment of other neurons. Uh, so th th usually they, they 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 use this argument to defend the, the, the deterministic models uh, instead of stochastic ones. Uh, what would be the, your answer to this uh, question? I mean, we we have exactly the same uh, bombardment effect. I mean, the, um, uh, there's many inputs, and um, we we some will be activated at a given time, some won't. So uh, from uh, we, we have the same effect as uh, the, the integrated and fire guys do, as far as I'm concerned. Um, it's just that we we yes, but then you you'd be doubling the stochasticity because no, you no, have no, I'm not, I'm not, not level, and then no, nope. uh, no, I am not because uh, so they 
the, the, the input to the, their network uh, is indeed a kind of uh, Poisson-like uh, spy train, so they have their real uh, source of, of uh, stochasticity. After that, everything is deterministic, and We 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 will have. Uh, and it's not that they they, they pick at random uh, one input versus another, and there's no there's no uh, stochasticity left in their in their uh, framework. I mean, as soon as you you pass the first uh, input level, so and they, um, the behavior of their, their if they look at a single cell within their their uh, that they are modeling. Uh, the, the membrane uh, path looks uh, random, but it uh, it is not. I mean, it's it's fully deterministic. Okay, so so uh, we we are not talking about the same thing when we talk about uh, stochasticity here. Uh, my point is that uh, they are eluding uh, uh, a viability uh, source that is there. I mean, it could be uh, tiny. I mean, sure. I mean, if if you start saying that uh, a single neuron receives uh, ten thousand inputs, um, uh, at a, at a given time you can have two hundred or more that are active. Uh, yes, then you will have you will have um, you could imagine that you have a reliable estimate of a mean, uh, which we will have exactly. I mean, we'll have it in the same way with our models. Um, but but we we are not adding uh, an extra uh, layer of, of uh, randomness uh, with respect to what they do. It could be that uh, our uh, I mean the randomness that that is there from the synaptic uh, fluctuation uh, is irrelevant at the end. But uh, we don't know. And if it's irrelevant, if it's if it is really irrelevant at the end, it will show up like that in our model also. Uh People who work on, on integrated fire type uh, single neural models, they, uh, they try to reproduce uh, different uh, spiking behaviors like adaptation and bursting. How do you, want to, how do you think it, this can be approached using your formalism? Exactly in the same way. You can, you can uh, so right now, the way uh, Eva wrote the. Uh, uh, so here. Uh, when you, uh, I should not point with my finger. So uh, until now, in the, the I set, they, they don't include the neuron itself, but you can include the neuron itself, and then you you have a, you will have an H I to I here, that you could use to to um, models like I mean favored in you, you see and and in fact when I when I when I fit this kind of model to actual data, I always have an HI to I that starts very negative mm -hmm. to be sure to have a refractory period. And then you can make it climb fairly fairly, fairly fast if you want to have a favored interspike interval, for instance. So you can you can partially capture this kind of behavior, I mean, in the way that people do it in um, integrated fire uh, models. Perhaps not in as in a way that is as sophisticated as what they do, but still we, we can try to capture the main effects. The last uh, exchange between uh, Christophe and Hawk um, recall me what Marcus Diesman said about in the, in the teaser interview. He said that the young neuroscientists should learn mathematics and discuss with people well, he did the same simulations working in the laboratory, but uh, there were two things to avoid. One is to to be too much attracted by the intrinsic beauty of mathematics. And, and the other is to believe very much in what uh, people uh, who already work in neuroscience believe. So, of course, uh, um, uh, this model is a wonderful model and it has been attracting mathematicians, including mathematicians who are not work with us, people like Francois Basseli. Eh? So it's a wonderful model, it's a challenging mathematical model. We can prove things about it and you can describe realistic um, behavior. So one of the one of the uh, things we must avoid is to forget about probably uh, neurobiological question. So 
from my point of view, uh, working with, uh, uh, for my, I guess, Eva thinks the same, working with Christophe is crucial because Christophe is all the time pushing uh, Eva and me back to the real neurobiological questions. But now I think it would be great if um, uh, Hawking and his team start um, doing simulation about this model, really simulation, because uh, otherwise we will not never be able to really interact. So uh, it was important to see that Eva um, stressed the point that our model is easy to simulate. So with the resources we have in the sim lab at Ribeirão Preto, it would be very easy to simulate large amounts of neurons and maybe find answers that we are not still uh, able to do theoretically and su suggest questions. So um, I, 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 I think it would be great if we could have more have more simulation. There are uh, previous work done by Cecilia Romalo, Fernando Najma, and Morgan André for the simulation of metastability in different types of models. But I, I, I wish more, more research in this direction was done. Sorry, no, it was just to compliment you. We are working in Nice on a simulation of those kind of processes, and we are currently reaching 10 to the power at least six or even nine sometimes neurons uh, of that. And we would be very happy to exchange with you about what would be nice to simulate since we can reach this amount of neurons to see what you want to see on those big simulation of networks. We would be very happy to. I had a, a last question and maybe it's linked to the simulation. Um, at one point in the teaser or at least in the part where you were telling us how good this model would be, it would be to answer some of the neuroscientist question. And one of them was, uh, can this model extrapolate to EEG or fMRI somehow? And uh, what kind of result do you have so far between the link of these kind of models and what you see in EEG or fMRI? I was just, I was curious. just curious. Good question. Did, did I see that? Did I say that, <laughs> Patricia? No, it's a good question. It's a uh, we have to work on that, but um, uh, we, we don't, I would say we don't have. I, but the, I, I would compliment saying that uh, since we can have, we can say something in some cases on um, in getting uh, differential equations, uh, describing uh, the, the, the mean behavior of the neurons, um, that's a step towards what you need to to, to say something about the EEG or, F or fMRI. Um, that's my uh, naive, uh, or what, what uh, Julien did also. Uh, I mean, uh, as soon as you, you, you can, fr f from the, the, the model at the single unit level, say something at the macroscopic level, and you, you have the tools you need to, to to make interesting statement potentially on on the EEG, but then um, the EEG is clearly another uh, in a step above in terms of complexity. This kind, this of, kind interaction of interaction works, works well, well inside, inside one region. Region. Uh, uh, The interaction between the do you think it's still the same kind of formula, or should it be something really different? I, I, my guess uh, is, and there's one one layer of complexity that we had to to add uh, is so right now uh, the models we ca we are considering are fairly uniform, not to say totally uniform. Um, no, we we have been yeah you you have the, 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 well, yeah the, okay the so we have multi population models yeah. where there are real interactions between different uh, so where there's yeah. spatial structure actually okay. between different populations yeah. so yeah you you would need uh, to to put this kind of uh, dynamics stochastic dynamics on a network that is itself uh, random and um, and it's it's an open question uh, what what uh, in in a real uh, neural network um what is the dominant effect is it the, the, the stochastic dynamics or deterministic if you want dynamics of of, uh, of uh, neurons or is it their uh, messy interconnections 
Um, so that, that's an open question as far as I'm concerned. Uh, but if you want to, to address um, questions that are actually indeed very important for the experimentalist, you will need, as you said, to consider uh, multi-regions uh, models. And there, yes, you, you, you need to have a, a different way to connect uh, neurons uh, within regions and across regions. Uh, Christophe, are you yeah. able to relate your physiological experiment, especially the physiological parameters, uh, to the models, uh, to the model parameter, for example, to the function H, or uh, are you able to calibrate the model of uh, Eva and Antonio to your experiment? Uh, so, uh, it's not fully done yet, but uh, the, the, um, the answer is, is yes. I mean, the, the key thing is that you need to include an, an H I to I um, kernel. Um, and the, 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 the frustrating part uh, is that this H I to I includes both uh, and the effect of uh, the, the biophysics of the neuron uh, onto the discharge and the effect of a part of the network that you don't see or that we don't see. Um, that means that when we want to look at uh, responses to odors in my, in my case, but as soon as you start applying a stimulus, uh, the, the stimulus could act uh, at many levels, and um, it's very hard to to say and to it, to interpret uh, the results you get um, when you need to change the, the, the self effects of the H I to I uh, of um, of a model. I, I'm not sh sure I'm clear enough. Um, so, I mean, the bottom line is that. Um, I, I can fit. The, I mean, I, I can get get good fits to the to the spike trains I observed, uh, knowing that the, the the tests we are we have are not very powerful. So it's 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 not that hard to 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 pass the tests. Uh, but the real challenge uh, I see is I mean arises from the fact that we just see a, a tiny part of the neurons in the network, and uh, that makes that the interpretation of the uh, HI to I uh, kernel I have to include uh, is not trivial at all. And that means we will have to, to go through extensive simulations, I think. We, we will have to make a, um, uh, a dialogue between uh, trying to extract parameters on a network that we, we kind of know, then simulate uh, a full-size network uh, from the parameters we've learned and try to refine. Um, we, we will, I think we will need to go through this kind of process at a point. Okay. Márcio Cassandro, Márcio Cassandro, you know, he's an expert in met stability. Uh, he wrote with uh, uh, Enzo Olivier, uh, one of the most important papers, the origin of the modern study of met stability. So Márcio said, uh, asked, what should be the role of met stability in the behavior of a neural system. Uh, the, the classical um, example is the working memory, where you, so you have this, this famous uh, uh, experiments uh, that st started in the, the early 70s, uh, where people were recording from the prefrontal cortex of, uh, of monkeys. So the, the monkey had to, was shown uh, different targets. Um, and it had to wait a few seconds before a signal, and when the signal came, he had to go to the target that had been shown in order to get a reward. So for, for a variable amount of time, the monkey must remember what, what is the, the, the target. And uh, you can apparently fairly easily find neurons in the, the prefrontal cortex, or in the, this part of the brain. I mean, in fact, um, that exhibit a sustained activity. So we, they, they start almost uh, silent, and uh, as soon as you show the, the, the target, they become very active, and they will remain active until the, the signal comes so that the, the monkey has to grab 
the 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 right point. Um, and if the, the this activity disappears before the signal comes, then the performance of a monkey is is uh, worse. So locally, it seems to to and the, the network seems to behave locally as going from a, a kind of resting state to a transiently uh, active state. And when it's in, in that state, it, it it looks stationary, but it can suddenly d disappear. And when you when you give a signal that uh, okay, now you should go for the target, psh, the, the activity disappears. So uh, metastability. Uh, it has been proposed for a long time to explain this kind of ph phenomenon with different mechanisms. Uh, that's what's that's one of the key uh, uh, setting where uh, it comes into play. <laughs>